Right, so we are uh, launching into a new series called Transitions, Transitions. So do we have in the house tonight anyone that is a creature uh, of habit? Anyone a creature of habit? All right, so, so I'm, I'm a creature of habit as well. Uh, in fact, so much so, I once got in a fight with my wife on what we should do for vacation. I didn't want to do anything. I said, it's my vacation. I can do what I want, and I want to do nothing. And you married a boring person, and you're a sucker. And um, don't recommend taking that approach in your relationships. Um, you should probably be a bit more gracious. Probably shouldn't say it's your vacation. Lots of things that I've learned along the way. Um, Anyway, I'm a creature of habit. I don't like uh, to change my daily routine. I make the same thing for breakfast. I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. Every single day for the last 10 years. I mean, occasionally I'll splurge and buy some mini wheats or something, but uh, I make my oatmeal. I go downstairs half asleep. I put, make the two bowls of oatmeal for me and Laura like with the blueberries and I put it in the microwave. I even got a system for like the one bowl goes over and like one section of the microwave and another one goes on this like dot in the microwave. And I uh, microwave it for five minutes while that's happening. I make my coffee while the coffee's kind of finishing getting brewed. I pull together our lunches for the day. Man, it is a system, let me tell you. And every day it's the same thing. Any tuna fans? Anyone a tuna fan? Yeah, okay. You can be proud. I remember when I was in the fourth grade, I just moved to Canada and uh, I love tuna. And I'd be like, I don't want my tuna sandwich. And I got bullied so bad I left the school. Um, anyway, tuna was just not my thing. Uh, but if I ate a tuna sandwich for the rest of my life, I'd be a happy man. Oatmeal, tuna sandwiches, and, uh, and that would be great. I love my routine. I feel like it creates efficiency. Uh, I tell my mother this, and she gets very worried. She's like, you're way too systematic, Robin. Any of you a creature of habit, right? Like, we, we, we love habit, we love systems, we love kind of doing the same thing all the time, and then inevitably, right, we get to a point in our life where we change, where either our situation changes, or our circumstance change, or uh, what we're working towards has changed. Maybe you've uh, just finished uh, a major uh, season where you're moving into something new. Change is a part of life, especially if you're kind of going through school. The, the transition from school into not school is a pretty tough one because you go through life being like every eight months or every year, I get to do a new grade. I get my new outfit in August or September. I look fly, and uh, that's the one time a year I buy clothes is in September. Uh, you kind of, you, you get into this rhythm, and then you finish, and then there's no more rhythm. You're like, life is okay. I got 80 years to kill. How am I going to spend it? But then transitions keep coming. They keep either their job transitions or relationship transitions. Maybe you're going to get married. Maybe you're going to have a kid. Uh, I would love some children at Lift Church. One day we're going to get there, and it's going to be amazing. No idea how we're going to do it. We'll figure it out as we go. That's what we do is we, we kind of, hey, we got kids. How are we going to make it work? Transitions are, are, are kind of just this, this part of, of life. And what I want to do over the next three weeks is examine how do we navigate and journey through seasons of major change, seasons of transition. How do we navigate with confidence, with purpose? How do we figure it out? So what I want to do is actually spend some time with my man Joshua. I love Joshua. So if you have your Bibles, flip on open to the book of Joshua. I think if you have one that looks like this, you can cheat. It's on page 131. Joshua is at the beginning of your Bible. It's right after the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, it is very easy to find. It's a guy named Joshua. It's about a, it is about a guy named Joshua and his leadership of the Israelites. So before I give you some context, why don't I read in chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Uh, are you guys there? Say, I'm there. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, if you're not there, you need to get there. It's going to be a fun time tonight. Joshua is a really fascinating guy. Okay, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promised you... I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. 
For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. I love this section. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then, then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm going to take a moment and pray. Jesus, as we dive into this new series, I thank you that you are a God that wants to be intimately involved in our lives. God, that as we navigate transition and uncertainty and not knowing how to make the next steps or what next steps to take, God, that you've given us instructions, that you've given us this incredible story that we can dive into in the book of Joshua. So God, I pray that you would help us to understand, help us to wrestle with what's happening here and how it still speaks to us today. Amen. All right, so what's happening in the book of Joshua, and what does it have to do with uncertainty and transition? Do you See, usually transition equals uncertainty. Usually when something's changing, it's changing, but we don't know how it's going to change. And that's where the Israelites found themselves in this situation. They were in a, a situation where they were about to step into something, and they didn't yet know how it was going to pan out, but they knew that they had to do it. So what had happened was they had arrived at the promised land, which was the land that God had committed to give them, a land, uh, as they say, flowing with milk and honey. It was a lovely place. And, uh, and they were there, it was God's promise that they would get this land, that it would be theirs, that he would have plans and purposes for it. And 40 years before this reading here in Joshua, Joshua and the Israelites arrived at the promised land just across from the Jordan River for the first time. And this first time they arrived... They, they got afraid. They looked at what was in the land, and they said, ah, oh, we can't do it. I'm going to get to that in just a second and expand exactly what happened there. It's fascinating. But as a result of their fear, God was like, all right, you guys got to go wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So what had happened was the Israelites had been freed from slavery in Egypt. Moses led them to the promised land. They got afraid. They got chicken, basically turned around, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and then they arrived back at the river, and it was time to cross the river. Except Moses dies. So their leader, the man that led them out of slavery, is now dead, and Joshua is called up to lead. He's called up, and God says, now is your time to lead. Now is your time to lead Joshua. Now put yourself in the Israelite shoes for a second. There's about a million of them, and it depends how you want to count it. You can go argue with the, uh, the seminary students here at Lyft about how many there was. I don't know. Say a million. A lot of people were crossing into the promised land. And, and as they're doing that, you've got to remember that these are people that have been slaves. Their identity is that of slaves. That of nomadic kind of wanderers. And yet they're looking at this river going, okay, we've got to cross this river and we've got to stop being nomadic slave wanderers. And now we've got to become a warrior conquesting kingdom. Talk about an identity shift. Talk about not knowing how to do things. And on top of that, their leader is now dead. And so this is where we find Joshua, and it's fascinating. God says to Joshua, therefore the time has come for you to lead these people. And so the question I want to know is, so facing all this transition, facing all this change, I mean, I'm sure they, were, they, were, they must have been terrified. They had never gone to war. They were not a war people. They were slaves. I'm sure they were, they were terrified. And so facing this transition, what I want to know is why did God choose Joshua to lead? Why did God choose Joshua to lead through the transition? So tonight I want to give you five. It's going to be really, really uh, applicable tonight. I want to give you five things. So if you're taking notes, we've got five things that Joshua did that I think helped them navigate the transition and help explain why Joshua was the leader that he was. All right, so some context. 
Actually, number one. Let's go, let's go straight into it. Number one. Number one tonight. Joshua. The first thing that I see about Joshua when I read this text is that Joshua was a person of vision. And that he had practiced becoming a person of vision. So first thing to navigating transition and uncertainty is become or practice becoming a person of vision. A person of vision. All right, so what do I mean? So as I said, 40 years earlier, you can go read the story in Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers chapter 13, Moses commissions a bunch of people to go into the promised land. He says, all right, you guys, I want you to go into the promised land and bring back a report on what you find. Go into the land and tell me what, what's in there, what's happening in the promised land. And so a bunch of them go and they come back and check out what they have to say. Check out what they have to say. Numbers 13 verse 32 they, they were pumped on it. They were like, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. So Moses, this place you've taken us, it's going to devour us. It's going to destroy us. We're going to die in this land. Whew. So they bring this report back, and all they could see was giants and people that would destroy them and kill them, and they were full of fear. And so they bring it back to the people of Israel, and the people of Israel hear word of this, and you know what their response is? I mean, their response is mind-blowing. When I, when I read the story, it's easy to, like, miss, like, how crazy it is. Numbers 14, verse 3, the people respond to this land that will devour them. And they say, wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? So they're looking at what's in front of them, and their response to this, this land that is in front of them that's going to devour and destroy them is, let's go back to being slaves. Let's go back to, 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 to making bricks and building the pyramids or whatever it is that we're doing. Let's go back to being slaves. We were slaves for a couple hundred years. Let's go back to doing that, because if we do that, at least we know it'll pan out kind of okay. Yeah, we'll be slaves, but at least we won't be destroyed. But then Joshua and his friend Caleb rock up to the scene. They were two of the spies that went into the land. And in response to this, check out what they have to say. So everybody else is saying the land is going to destroy us. It's going to devour us. It's going to kill us. We're going to die. Check out Joshua's response. The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. So in other words, Moses' vision, instead of being focused on those that could kill them or those that would destroy them or how all the things could go wrong, his vision was built upon the promises that God had made. He became a person of vision, a person that could see, a person that could see potential where everybody else is seeing disaster. And for 40 years, probably even before that, Moses, or sorry, Joshua was a person that practiced becoming a person of vision. But I think so often in our moments of uncertainty, in our moments of kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen, we're not really people of vision. We're not really people that see potential. We just see all the ways that things can go wrong. All the ways that, that I can go south. But it's in these moments where we're, where we're looking to the future, we're got, saying, I don't know what's next. I don't know if I'm going to be unemployed in a month. I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know what's going to happen. It's in these moments that we get to practice being a person of vision. We get to practice saying, okay, what's the opportunity here? What's the potential here? What's in front of me? You see, here's the thing. Uncertainty is a reality in life. We will all face situations and we will all journey through situations that will be unsure. One of the questions I get asked most often is how do I know so-and-so is the one, the one I'm going to marry, right? How do I know? And it's this question that is sort of filled with this sort of this kind of combination of excitement and stress. This sense of excitement in the sense of like, okay, there's some potential here, but then some worrying about, I don't know how it's going to pan out. And what we want is we want to know, okay, if I, if I get into this relationship, is it going to be okay? Is it going to pan out? Is it going to work out? Is it going to... And we fear it, and then we, we say, ah, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm going to take a step back. But what if we were people of vision, that we allowed vision to dictate our decisions? 
So in the case of looking at maybe a spouse or a relationship, what a vision was the question that we were asking. So instead of asking, what are all the ways that this can go wrong? What are all the ways that this person pushes me to Jesus? What are all the ways that we could serve the Lord together? What are all the ways that we can honor God with our relationship? What are all the ways that we can bless and be a blessing in our relationship? I would suggest to you tonight, if, if the answers to those questions are not good, then maybe you need to revisit things. But if you can come up with answers to those questions, if you can develop a vision for where things are going, man, there's so much potential in that. See, there's the, a difference between certainty and vision. When I look back over my own life, every major decision I have had to make, I have had to make in uncertainty. The woman I married. I remember when I, when I graduated, I just proposed to, to Laura, and the plan was to go and be poor grad students together. Uh, it was a bold vision. It was uh, kind of dumb, but it was awesome. So I proposed, and we were going to go be poor grad students, and then six months later, I wasn't in grad school Instead, I had taken a job, and instead of kind of helping lead, serve the church here at Lyft, I ended up leading the church for the first time. I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember looking at the decisions that I made. I made them wishing for certainty, but uncertainty was never a reality. I had to make the decisions not based upon what I knew would happen, but based upon a vision for the future. And so it goes with marriage. So it goes with your career, so it goes with potential things that you're going to invest into with serving. So it has gone in my life with planting churches or, or pastoring this church. It's always predicated on a sense of uncertainty combined with a sense of vision. And Joshua had spent his life becoming a person of vision. Number two tonight, so number one is practice becoming a person of vision. Number two is practice being the person that you want to be. Practice being the person that you want to be. I'm going to tie this to Joshua in a sec, but let me give you an example of what I mean by this. I mean, a lot of people that, that come to me with kind of visions, one of the reasons I love this church is that it's full of people with a lot of vision. Most of you do not struggle with number one. Most of you have, and many of you as I, as I journey with you, you have vision and you see potential. But where I think sometimes we struggle is that where we see ourselves being and where we currently are, there seems to be a disconnect. Sometimes I meet people and they're like, I want to be a pastor. I'm like, great. Who are you pastoring today? Well, I'm not pastoring anyone. I don't really believe in pastoring. I believe in, I'm like, so you want to be a pastor, but you don't believe in pastoring. Pastoring doesn't happen because you get up on a stage and somebody gave you a job. Pastoring is a way of life. Similarly, it's like, I want to be an engineer. I want to build great things. It's great. I love the vision. What are you building? Tell me what you're building. I'm not building anything. I'm too busy to build. I want to be a nurse. I want to love people. Well, who are you serving? Well, I'm not, I'm not really, I don't really believe in serving. I don't I'm, you see, when there's a disconnect between who we want to be in the future and who we are today, that's a problem. And see, for many of us, the hinge here is not a hinge of opportunities. As I said, we don't lack opportunity and we don't lack vision. It's a hinge, I believe, of convenience. It's fascinating. I, I, I love the scriptures. I love the scriptures. So, okay, let me pull this together for you. So Joshua is saying, the land is full of potential. It's awesome. God's going to bless us. It's going to be fruitful. And then I keep reading, and you'd think the people would be like, yeah, this is great. Mo uh, all you idiots who see, uh, you know, the giants are going to kill us. You're wrong. Joshua and Caleb are right. We're going to go storm the castle. It's going to be fantastic. That would be the response, right? Like, all this potential. Check out what, how, the, how the community responded. How do you guys think the community responded? If you were to put yourselves in your red shoes, how would they have responded to Joshua stepping up to the plate? <laughs> Verse 10 of Numbers 14. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. When I read that, I was like, sorry, what? In response to them saying there's potential, it was, hey, let's just kill these guys. Let's, let's just off with them. Let's just stone them because they're, they're wrong and they're crazy. You see, Joshua had practiced being the person he wanted to be even when it was inconvenient, even when it was difficult. 
This is crazy. Even when it was going to cost him his life, he was willing to actually do the things that he was called to do. You see, we delay what we're called to do today because it's inconvenient. I'll lead, I'll, I'll follow, I'll serve, I'll do all these things when I'm out of the season of transition. When I'm out of season of uncertainty. But yet when I look at Joshua, it's precisely in the moments of uncertainty that we become the people that we will be in the future. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a set of weights. We all want to be like jacked and ripped, except for me. My wife congratulated me. She said, uh, it was a big compliment. She's like, Robin, you have like better and better cyclist arms every week, which means skinnier and skinnier arms. I'm like, yes. And then I see the videos of me preaching. I'm like, my hands are oversized and my arms are really skinny and it looks really dumb. Um, but I'm okay. I'm cool with it because cyclist arms, it's amazing. But for everybody else in the world uh, with half a brain, they're like, I want to get jacked, right? I want to I wanna look fit. I want to look really good. And uh, so it's kind of like this. We, we go to the gym and we look at the barbell and we're like, I'm going to pick that barbell up. I'm going to pick it up. You see, I see you. I'm going to pick you up. And we look at the barbell and we kind of walk around it. We're like, it's got 45 pounds on it. I'm going to pick it up in the future, next week. I'll be back to pick you up next week when, when I'm less busy. My ankle's a bit this week. And so we look at it and we walk away. We walk out of the gym. And then next week we come back and we like, I still see you. I'm going to pick you up next week. And we do this over and over and over again. Well, I don't know. I, my, I might hurt myself if I pick you up. I might not be able to do I'll, I'll try again next week. Uh, my stomach's. And we make up these excuses and we, and we, it's ridiculous, right? Obviously, if you want to pick the barbell up, you have to pick the barbell up. Obviously, if you want to be the person you want to be in the future, you have to start by being it today, even when it's inconvenient, even when, when I look at Joshua, the people were willing to stone him. He was willing to be a leader that had vision, a leader that was willing to step up to the plate when it was inconvenient. It's interesting. God goes on to say, you guys, you, you want all this certainty. You want, we, we want all this certainty. We want to know how it's going to go before we get there. But then God says to Joshua in verse 4 of chapter 1, From the Negev wilderness in the south, to the Lebanon mountains in the, in the north, to the Euphrates River in the east, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. In other words, where you're going, there's going to be mountains. There's going to be rivers you have to cross. There's going to be people you have to evict. There's going to be seas that you have to defend. There's going to be wilderness that you have to journey through. Joshua, where you're going to go, it's going to be difficult. But I know you can do it because you have led in difficulty before. You've done this before. He goes on four times to say to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Joshua, be strong and courageous. Where you're going is uncertain, but I know you can lead in it, but I need you to be strong and courageous. You see, we want certainty before we act. But yet when I look at Joshua, God is saying to Joshua, I need you to be strong and courageous because it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. It's going to require some trust. It's going to require you to step out onto the battlefield maybe for the first time. It's going to require you to stand up and lead a bunch of people that maybe, maybe they don't want to be led. You see, the answer to uncertainty and confusion is not certainty and how things will pan out. It's not about guaranteed results. See, we want to know the end before the story begins. But the truth of the matter is that when we start to combine vision with being who we want to be in the future today, we start to realize that it's actually about trusting the promises that God had given Joshua. See, Joshua's hope was in God's promises. And so he practiced. He said, God, you promised you promised this land, so when I, I'm going to see vision, I'm going to step through, I'm going to follow through with it because you made a promise. Let me give you a really practical example of what I mean about being the person you want to be in the future today. 
The scriptures often talk about being generous, right? This is this idea of, of giving and, and being generous. Maybe uh, the idea of tithing, maybe you've heard of it before. And often what I was, I was chatting with someone this week, they said to me, well, Robin, I'll, I'll give, I'll be generous when I have enough. And in my head, I was going, yeah, but you, you don't get it. The reason we're called to give and be generous as a church, whether it's time or money, it has nothing to do with giving or serving out of our abundance. See, the crazy thing about tithing, the crazy thing about giving is that it is a willful and intentional step into uncertainty. It is a willful and, intention, and intentional step that says, okay, I'm going to step into uncertainty. I'm going to step into something I don't know. I'm going to step not knowing how it's going to pan out. And it's amazing as we do that, the power of control, the power of desiring control in our life starts to be released. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a tangent, but I think it illustrates this idea of when we start to learn to step into uncertainty, when we start to learn to practice doing what we want to do in the future today, it starts to change us. And the power of desiring to know everything is actually released in our lives. All right, all right. I'm, I'm on a tangent. Number three. So number one, practice becoming a person of vision. Number two, practice being the person you want to be in the future. Today, number three is two words. I love it. Two words. Follow instructions. Follow instructions. Do we have any rule followers in the room? All the rule followers are putting up their hands because they're rule followers, right? Follow instructions. All right, I'm just going to read Joshua 1, verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then. Now, I just want to pause on the word then for a second. God is speaking to Joshua. And God is saying, do this then. Do this then. We need to pay attention when the scriptures say, when God is saying, here, do this thing then. In other words, God is saying, if you do these things, I'm making a promise. I'm making a commitment to you. The word then means, hey, hey, pay attention. I'm about to tell you something. I'm about to give you a little nugget. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, only then, Will you prosper and succeed in all you do? All right, so here's the deal. We're like, yeah, yeah, be strong and courageous. Be a person of vision. Practice being that person. Amen, pastor, I can do that. I can be a person that is strong and courageous. You're saying I can conquer any mountain, conquer any wilderness. Amen, I can, I, I can do that. I can, I can go there. I can, I can be that person. I love it. I love it. Keep telling me how I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. Keep telling me about how God has plans to prosper me. Keep telling me about all the great things that God has in store for me. But then we keep reading. Be careful to obey. Obey? I thought you were talking about being strong and courageous. And overcoming uncertainty and transitioning. And, and you're talking about obey. Sorry, what? Obey. Study this book. Meditate on it obey it, then you will prosper and succeed. So the instructions that God is giving Joshua is, okay, look, we, I know, I trust you that you can lead. I trust you that you can be a person of vision. But I need you to obey me. I need you to follow me. I need you to walk with me. I, I need you to not just make it up as you go. I've given you instructions, Joshua, for, for a rich and a fulfilling life. Follow them. Listen to them. Honor them. Pursue them. It's like, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I like all the courage stuff. I like all the, the, the vision stuff. I didn't like the bit about tithing. Eh, whatever. I like, I like this kind of like, I can conquer, I can do attitude. I don't like this bit about obedience. Why does that got to be in there? Well, like, you know, we want to rest in the promises of God without following any of the instructions of God. I introduced a saying to, uh, 
to the uh, to the to the first service. It didn't really catch on. I'm gonna try it with you guys. You can tell me. You can give me thumbs up or thumbs down, sort of like gladiator style. Um, I call it the all cake and no veggies approach to God. The all cake and no veggies. So in other words, we want to eat our cake. We want to we want to eat our cake, but we don't really want to follow any of the instructions that God has given us about you know things that we should do. We want to rest in the promises and the glorious truths, but we don't really want to actually do anything to get there. We want to be able to just eat cake all the time. The people of Israel were about to face a massive, unbelievably difficult trial. They were about to step into something that they had never done before. They were about to go to war. They were about to do all these things that they didn't know how to do. And throughout the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua, God is preparing them. And when I read, I see two main concerns in the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua that God had for the people of Israel. The first concern that he had for them as he stepped into the season of transition was that they would forget what he had done for them. So he routinely, and we'll discover this next time, uh, next week, he has them make these memorials. He says, remember where your strength com comes from. You think your strength comes from the strength of your arm, but actually it comes from me. I'm your provider. I'm your God. He wants them to remember him. Remember me. Remember me. But then he has a secondary concern, and the secondary concern is that the people of Israel would remain distinct from the culture that they were surrounded by. He wanted to make sure that they would walk in relationship with him, that they would walk in the way that he had given them that was fulfilling and good and life-giving and honorable. Because he knew if they just did whatever they wanted, if they didn't follow any instructions, they would just become like the people in the land that they were moving into. And we talked about this before. There were people of child sacrifice and all kinds of crazy stuff. You see, for God, it was not just that they had arrived at the promised land. See, God is not just concerned with the destinations in your life. He is just as concerned with the manner and the quality in which you get thereby. See, it's not just about what you do and the things that you apply yourself to and the situations you find yourself in. It's about the quality, the, the degree, the honor in which you, you do them by. The book of Joshua is, in fact, about a journey, about a people that were not, not so much arriving at a destination, but that God was trying to coach them and saying, this is what it's like to follow me. And see, the thing is, faced with uncertainty, Faced with transition, it's easy to be kind of lax. Kind of like, well, I don't, I don't really, it doesn't really matter how I live, right? Like, I'm not really leading anything. I'm not really doing anything. How does it matter? Why does it matter how I live? Maybe for some of us, when we, when we kind of don't know what to do, maybe you're going to find yourself disconnected from a church community, and I would hope that you can always prioritize getting involved and getting connected into a church community. You're going to revert back to what you know. Well, I don't, no one's really telling me how to live, so I'm just going to, you know, do what I've always done. It's interesting that the people of Israel would always revert back to doing what they always did. They, they, they make calves out of gold and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's a tendency to revert back and become lax with the way we live our lives, especially in times of uncertainty because we inevitably feel kind of ungrounded. So it just becomes like, ah, oh, whatever. I know the word says to, to not get drunk but I don't like that part, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. I know the word says to, to be generous, but uh, I know the word says to be honest and, and live above reproach and to live in a way that would point people to Jesus, but eh. I know the word says to be praying continuously, but I don't know how to pray continuously. I don't even know how to pray at all, so I'm just not going to pray, period. Even though the word says to pray continue. I love the way Philippians says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. But maybe you're like, oh, but Robin, I'm just in a season of uncertainty. I mean, is this a small thing? Like, I only, like, you know, once in a while, it's kind of like a little, like, white lie, or it's kind of like my one thing. Everybody's got to have their one thing, right, Robin? Everyone's got to have the one thing that they do. 
Yeah, but is it honorable? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it commendable? You see, perhaps your life is uncertain right now in terms of where you're going or what destination you're going to arrive at or what things you're going to invest into. But you know what your life is never uncertain with? The way you live. The reason God says to them, follow instructions, is that the way we live here, regardless of circumstance, whatever is lovely, whatever is honorable, whatever is commendable. Now, sometimes we're afraid as a church of saying, do this and don't do that. Because we're afraid of tying, and, and, and this is something that we do need to be careful of, of tying our, our sense of knowing that we are loved by God to the way we perform for God. You see, there's nothing that we can do in all creation that can separate us from the fact that God loves us. What I'm talking about tonight is not whether or not God loves you. He loves you. What I'm talking about tonight is whether or not we walk in the things that are commendable. Whether we walk in a life that produces life. Whether we walk in a life that produces goodness. You see, what God is saying here is he's saying, I want you to follow my instructions. But in following my instructions, my hope is that you would get to know my character. That you would get to know me. That you would get to know my heart. Meditate on it and internalize it. Maybe tonight you're saying, I don't even know what the word says, Robin. Fortunately tonight, the message for here is simple. Open up the scriptures to the book of John. It'd be a good start. And start reading about Jesus. How did Jesus live? How did he call us to live? My fourth point is kind of just a, a, a quick extension on that. I'm going to dive into it much more in the coming weeks. But it is this. Establish your values. So point number one was become a person of vision or practice becoming a person of vision. Number two, brain is gone. <laughs> Thank you, that was awesome. Practice being the person you want to be. I love you guys. My brain was just gonzo. Uh, number one, practice being a person of vision. Number two, practice being a person that you actually want to be. Number three, follow instructions. Number four, establish your values establish your values. You see, when you are faced with uncertainty, when you're faced with a decision of not knowing what to do next, it's going to be the things that you value that will help you make those decisions. So the question for you tonight is, what do you value? What's your value system built upon? You see, for Joshua, Joshua's value system that helped him become a leader, helped him become a person that would step into things, was he valued God's promises. He valued the promises of God. So he said, God, you promised that you would give us this land, so I'm going to choose to believe that. I'm going to make the decision to say that we should go into the land based on your promises, not based on the threat. You see, when our, when our values are firm in the promises of God, all of a sudden everything changes. You see, it's easy to make and establish a decision-making process based on friends, maybe even your family. I'm going to talk about the importance of, of influencers next week, but, but I think the first question is, what's your value system? How do you make decisions? What do you value? Do you value convenience? Do you value kind of just like making it up as you go? What's your value system? And finally tonight, Number five, realize that you, even in a season of uncertainty, have a purpose. Realize that you, even in a season of uncertainty, have a purpose. Joshua was stepping up into the purposes of leading the people into the future that God had for them. Did they know how it was going to pan out? No, but he knew that God had placed them there at that time and that place. And you see, the beautiful thing about being the church is that we are never of, of lack or with lack for our purpose. We're never sitting here going, I don't know what to do with my time. I don't really know why I'm alive. I don't really know what my, my future holds for me. You see, Jesus has actually commissioned us. He said, here's the deal, church. I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to go and introduce people to me. I want you to go and bring this hope into the world. 
See, at the end of the day, we might not know what the next specific step is, but we always know that we have a job to do, and that job is to make disciples. It doesn't matter if you're cooking or cleaning. It doesn't matter if you're working as a lawyer or as an engineer. It doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom. Your job is to make disciples. And you see, the beauty is, is that job is true independent of whether you're in a season of transition or uncertainty or in a season of security or in a season of rest. You know, I, I, I sometimes wonder, it's going around, and I don't know how to live. I don't know what's next for me. I don't, I don't know how to spend my time. I have a radical proposition for you tonight. If you're facing a season where you have that question, I don't know how to spend my life. What if you did what Jesus did? What if you actually opened up the word and, and realized, well, Jesus, he healed some people, so I'm going to go pray for some people. And Jesus, he, he fed some people, so I'm going to go feed some people. And, and Jesus, Jesus made friends with people and gave them hope, so I'm going to go do that. And, and, and he taught people the hope of the gospel. And he called people to repentance. And, and he, he said, love the orphan and the widow. So I'm going to go love the orphan and the widow. And he said, what if we actually got read what he said to do? What happens if we actually went and visited those in prison? Or those who were without a home? Or those who are sick? I love that our church is visiting. I think this is the first time we've ever gone actually into the hospital with Ronald McDonald House. That is a privilege that is years in the making. I love that we get to go visit some sick kids. You know what? That's the work of Jesus. We might not know what to do with our lives sometimes, but we always know what to do. We might not know exactly how to make it work out, but we always have something to do. We're never left without purpose. We're never left wondering if our lives matter. We're never left... You see, uncertainty can present opportunity. Opportunity to be intentional, opportunity to use our time wisely, opportunity to invest intentionally in people. What if in this season of uncertainty view, you were intentional about investing in people? You were intentional about establishing vision. You were intentional about establishing your values. You were intentional about practicing the things and becoming the person that you want to be. You see, we think we live in uncertainty, but actually we live in a great degree of certainty. Not certainty in our circumstances, but certainty in who we trust. Certainty in who we walk with. Certainty in what our purpose is. So let me pray tonight.